mic, camera, action. I hope you're enjoying your last meal. This is it. This is all I want. A dozen men. I think you'll find it's more than enough. I'm ready to meet my maker. Are you? Who are you expecting, Terrell? Catch me off guard? Me standing here waving a white flag? You ever heard the saying, the enemy of my enemy? He's my friend. I don't have friends. I got family. Well, I got a lot of friends. Welcome back to Filmography, the show dedicated to watching every credited film from an actor's complete back catalogue from past debut through to present day in chronological order. Each episode, I'm joined by an esteemed guest or guests to watch and discuss the next entry from the Focus Filmography and consider how it ranks amidst their career and whether we can trace any typecasting trends or topic traits or theatrical ticks. For episode 36, I'm joined by the fast Chris Phelps and the furious Dave Horrocks to discuss the 36th big screen appearance of the Staith in the seventh entry in the seventh most successful film franchise of all time, Fury 7. We watch, you listen, and hopefully watch along too. So, gents, thank you both for coming on. It's a key moment in the Staith's career. It's that accelerating turn into kind of like super blockbuster. Like he's become one of the biggest actors on the planet now. Who better to come and discuss this turn, this entry into Fast and Furious world, the, 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 the pair of you. Then, as from what I can see today, Vin Familiar and Fast and fucking nonsense. <laughs> so I, I've got to say, right, I, I was just talking before about the VHS strikes back and the fact that we always record at the same time on a, on a Saturday morning and, and Chris and I will make up little names uh, to mm. join you know, and try and put each other off and stuff. So, sorry, it's our juvenile <laughs> selves coming through there. I was looking forward <laughs> to no, it when no it's on you as I was logging on. It was going to be there. So, I was, I was excited. Sorry to have broken that fourth wall for you, actually. Given the game away. <laughs> well, Jack, the thing is, when we did, uh, what was the, the, the lifeguard one the other week, Dave? Remember the, the Aussie one we did? Um, oh, oh, God. Basically, it, whenever so I exchange lifeguards, exchange wet lifeguard, and wild summer wet and in, wild, the, in the US. It. Well, mine's usually about women's, uh, you know, body parts. If, if there's a movie like that, so it'd mm. be something to catch Dave off usually. Um, <laughs> but yeah, something along them lines. Unless it's a pure Lauren Avedon loving, but there you go. But uh, anyway, carry on, Jack. Sorry. No, no, it's great. I mean, this is what we're here for, isn't it? For the, the backwards and forwards. I like the familiar sense. You know, we are the comics emotion family. I've got the two Godfathers on, which is great. It all seems to, to to have worked out perfectly. And what I'm really looking forward to is everyone's different history with this. Chris, I know you're a big fan. I know, despite you being a big fan, you prefer the earlier stuff. Dave, you're coming yeah. into this pretty pretty fresh, I would say, um, without much experience of the franchise <laughs> at all. Well, the first two I watched mm -hmm. when they came out on, uh, I'm sure... It was probably DVD. I'm sure I had like a love film, a, a love mm -hmm, film mm -hmm. subscription or something like that. So I, I watched the first two, and I kind of they they're okay, you know, classic story. Someone's trying to uh, it's like smoking the bandit, basically, isn't it? They're trying to nick Whoa. DVD. They're trying <laughs> to nick DVD players as opposed yeah. to cause beer. You know, which is referencing yeah, this one actually. I like it. This one, Mr. Nobody yeah. calls it out. Yeah, these high stakes things. But 
Um, so yeah, lots of. I mean, it, it was real, st- really stylish, wasn't it? And these cars were fantastic, and and the bright colours. So you know, I enjoyed them, but without feeling like, oh, I've got to watch the next thing and then i think it might have been i i I obviously heard the really sad news about paul walker passing and then was shocked to to learn that well fucking hell there's there's loads of these sequels like how did that happen (laughs) but not only that they make a fuckload of money so (laughs) how i I couldn't equate what i saw in the first two movies because normally you you start off with this big concept it, it goes massive you might have something like, say, Terminator or Aliens, which, which, where the sequel is bigger than the original. But normally, mm. you're into diminishing returns, aren't you? Normally, it tails off a bit, but this just seemed to get bigger and bigger. But it was one of those as well. It's probably how people feel about the MCU. It's like, well, okay, well, I, 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 do I really need to watch twenty odd movies to? to understand what's going on when you've got like 10 sequels or something and spin-offs and whatever it sort of put me off even trying to be honest but it was quite uh, exciting to come in because i know uh, you know I, I can feel its aura you know and i, I thought oh, i'm not going to be able to avoid it forever so so this was a good opportunity to dive in mm. and chris you you're a purist aren't you you're a dvd stealing yeah. fast and furious fan I am. I know when we did the review on VHS, I was mm. like, you know, the first one still holds up for me. I absolutely love it. And even though, you know, we talked about this when we did it, Dave, it's basically Point Break. You know, that's what they said, didn't they? Fast and Furious is a rip-off of Point Break, really. The cop, you know, goes undercover and all that sort of thing. But I think I've been to cinema. So when they rebooted it, Fast and Furious, it was the, it's the fourth one, but it was called Fast and Furious. And I, I wasn't sure where it was going to go because I must admit, the first one I loved, the second one was good, where it had, uh, you know, Tyrese, Too Fast, Too Furious. Um, the third one, the Tokyo Drift, I was like, mm, not sure. But then you do get, if you've never seen it, though, if you're going to watch it, Dave, but there is an Easter egg about, you know, Vin Diesel's character, you know, you know Dominic Toretto. And then, obviously, we then get the fourth one, which was about eight, nine years later when they rebooted it. And I remember going to cinema to watch it. And what was really random, we'll see about this today, is my mother and father, and my father all passed away in 2016, but they loved the Fast and Furious movies. Like, they used to go to the cinema to watch them. I don't know why. <laughs> like, not into cars or anything, but from four to, obviously, would have been seven, because he passed away in 2006, they watched these. I think they even bought a couple of them. I don't know how the hell they got into them. I do not know. It's just one of them random things. We're like, oh, we're going to the cinema to watch it. But we've been... To, to every one of them since Fast Four, me and Sam with Jordan, and then even Hobbs and Shaw, I went to the cinema. We've had a kick off in the cinema because four lads were being bell ends, fucking dicking around, and I did the and they're like, "You what?" I went, "I'm trying to watch this." So when it, and I remember Sam's going, "Shaw, I'm going." I was like laughing, going, "Go outside, lads! I'm trying to watch this." You know, and they're like, I'm sorry, Mister, sorry. And then they couldn't resist, and they were dicking around again. But it was near the end, and we're okay. But so I've seen all of them. Until the last one, which I watched mm. a couple of months ago, but I watched that at home, and even my fucking jaw was on the floor with this. So <laughs> I, I, every time I watched this movie over the last couple of days, I just kept thinking of Dave because you know this. Anyone who's watched Fast and Furious, there is so many plot things that they try to give you as a, someone who's never watched it. They try and give you a little bit of context of what's going on. There's so much shit and dodginess goes on in these this movie <laughs> that. I was just pissing myself laughing, going, Dave has not got a fucking clue what. Even some of the lines in the movie, I was like, he hasn't got a clue what any of this means. You know, so it is, it, it's a really interesting film you've picked, obviously, because of the state and that. I totally get it. And these other ones you could have picked, but it's his jumping on point within the series. But we'll, we'll talk about it, Dave, because. Yeah, even I think we've not only jumped the shark, we've jumped fucking flipper, we've jumped the whale, we've jumped everything in this one. Unbelievable, even buildings. So uh, anyway, amazing stuff. I'm so glad you picked it though, Jack. You know, we didn't know where we were going to go to because we were trying to go Dave into watching them all and obviously um, life gets in the way and he just probably generally didn't want to waste eight, <laughs> nine, ten, eleven, who knows how many hours having to watch them all. I did do five, six, seven in the build up to tonight. Yeah. But only because I think those three together make such a neat little kind of trilogy. It's like the Hobbs trilogy within this overbearing, as we know, like 10, 11 films, I suppose, franchise. 
I haven't seen Fast X yet. You see, anyone I haven't seen, I missed it ah. in the cinema. And it got to yeah. that point where I just thought, actually, I'm just going to wait. And I'm going to wait and do it fresh for when I get to that point in the Stace career. So that's the only one I haven't seen, which I, you know, we know in nine, just in case, Dave, you know, we don't want to spoil it. There's, there is a, you can't even call it jumping the shark. You can call it jumping out of gravity, I suppose. Oh my moment God. Moment in Fast yeah. Nine. Yeah. Um, how about jumping me. the Meg? Yeah. Where, where yeah well, he, he, he punches <laughs> yeah. the Meg, doesn't he, in Meg 2? So, um, <laughs> no, no, I mean, and Zach, you're so right, Dave. There is a bit in, in Nine. And you, someone who likes your science, and you know you and you, you understand like the physics, you know the general physics. You'll call out oh, what? physics and gravity and all those things. I, I can already put no. those to the side. I swear <laughs> sure. to God. But and, and Jack, because you've not seen the last one, mm. even I was sat there going, "I might be out. I'm still going to watch the final one." But I was like, "It is." On a level I have never seen in this last one. The last one is, I'm not saying it's not a good film because the action's great and everything, but yeah. I, I And you haven't seen, is it Fast Five with the plane on the fast runway? Six is is that fast, fast Six, Dave. I swear it's, to God, it's, it's the one we call this. To in this one, isn't it? Oh, I, I, me, it, it, yeah. it, it's unbelievable. Anyway, let's. I, I don't want to jump too far, but yeah, it... it, it the logic of the just stealing DVDs and TVs <laughs> has just gone on a level you've never seen. It's unbelievable. It, it's almost like Baywatch, basically, isn't it? I mean, it's like you've got lifeguards who are also equivalent of FBI agents. <laughs> I mean, that's that's sort Marines. of what this is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're like into their international espionage and everything. Like, but anyway, I th- yeah, I mean. There's no point like tiptoeing around it. It is ridiculous. It is over the top. It's at this point now. I think this is the one really where they decide, yeah. fuck it, fuck it. We'll just do whatever we want. It doesn't matter anymore. Six, you're right. Has the um, has the plane sequence, which is kind of yeah. lampooned for a long time, wasn't it? They somebody worked out how oh long God. that runway must have been in order for that sequence to have taken place in the amount of time it takes <laughs> in the movie, and it was like miles and miles and miles and miles long, wasn't it? Longest runway I've had. They're on a motorway basically for three hours, Dave. Before yeah. it took off. But um, this oh. is the one. But I think they know it here as well. They're just like we yeah. honestly. I think six was like the testing ground. Five, five is the best for me. It's it's still in the realms of reality. But I do think six and seven. They just have so much to offer. Six was that testing ground of like, can we? And people went with it. And then it was like, well, okay, we really obviously can. So we're just going to do whatever we want doesn't matter there's no effect on anyone we're going to throw people through walls we're going to drive cars off buildings nobody's ever going to get injured but nobody cares it's it's a superhero movie without anyone wearing a cape isn't it so basically that that was going to be my point is that this is more comic book than most of the comic book movies (laughs) you know if you think about what uh what warner brothers are always trying to do they're always trying to make darker grittier batman movies Whereas this is just ridiculous nonsense. It's over the top action, but it is a, a superhero movie. Mm. They're just not wearing spandex. That's the only difference. So I can kind of, yeah. I, I, I can understand why people, Chris, you were saying about, you know, your, your grandparents and I, they, they love it. I, I can see why people get sucked in. We talk about things like Lethal Weapon, you know. <laughs> Where Martin Riggs is is kind of legging it down a motorway after a car or whatever. You know, these are just larger than life superheroes, and so that that's yeah. what I think. And and again, saying about the Warner Brothers making da- Batman all dark and everything, this is the opposite end of the scale, isn't it? Everything is colourful and bright. So yeah, I do get it. It, it is utter fucking nonsense, like <laughs> everything about it. And I tell you, I mean, I, I can't remember when this, when, when was this one? 2015? Mm-hmm. I mean, that was after Me Too, wasn't it? But fucking hell, you know, yeah. there was more upskirt shots and, and, you know, objectification of women than I was expecting, to be honest. But I I, I don't know if that's a theme throughout, but I, I was that was one aspect where I was a little bit surprised at how uh, blatant that was. It is something that's always been there and it's never gone away, has it, Chris? It's It's been there from no. day one, really. 
from that first kind yeah. of race war scene in the first movie where it's girls wearing as little as humanly possible and lying and all over cars and uh, we've always got the girl who does the, the start of the race haven't we so that's always mm. been there since since day dot yeah yeah, and, and she was rather attractive, the Asian girl. I must admit that. I did like the tattoos. But, yes, I do think... Um... Hey, listen, I'm not saying I'm complaining. I'm just <laughs> saying I was surprised by it. <laughs> but, well, I think, I think you're absolutely right, Dave. Like, with this, I find now... I think one of the... For me personally, Jack, and you'll know this, I think one of the worst things he did in this franchise was bring the rock in. Mm. Because Vin Diesel... For me, the first one, he was this, you know, he was painted out. He was basically this bruiser, like mechanic, stroke racer. He didn't even drive muscle cars in the first one. It was only at the end that he did. He was actually in the Japanese, like, uh, JDM cars, which is what Brian drives, you know, through it and everything. That's what he's racing in. He's in a Nissan and stuff in the first one. It's only at the end because it's his dad's car that he finishes, that he gets in the Dodge Charger. And then from there, when he comes back, obviously, I think in the, and the Tokyo Drift, I think he's in a Dodge mm. Charger. But then it's after that, he's always got a Dodge Charger. Now, in this movie, it, it, these bits where he's in a Plymouth uh, Barracuda and stuff like that, but the actual main bits when he's, like, going down the hills and all that, he's in a Charger and when he's in, like, the car park. And that's his thing, American Muscle. As someone who loves American Muscle, I absolutely love the first one when he races Brian at the end and the engine, you know, wheel, wheel pops up and everything. But the problem is, he brings the Rock in. They have a fight in the fourth one. But The Rock is clearly, I mean, he's never six foot five, The Rock. He's absolutely Hulk Hogan in his size. He's probably about the same height as me. He's probably about six two. But either way, he's built like a fucking brick shit house. You know, Samoan heritage, everything. He's just a monster. And Vin Diesel's probably about 5'10". All right, he used to be a bouncer and everything. I know he can probably look after himself. But the sheer size of him against The Rock when they had the fight is bollocks. But the problem is, I can't buy Vin Diesel as Dan, uh, Daniel Dominic Soretto anymore because he's... He's a big bloke in the context of the rest of the cast until the rock's in it. And then he just looks like a fucking, he just looks. And then he said the M word again, Dave, that you were laughing about the other day in VHS, but, um, you know, vertically challenged person, you don't have to say any more things with an M. Um, <laughs> and, um, but he does, he just looks purely compared to. No, no, well, well, don't worry about it. The, the, the week before was even better. But, um, yeah. but, but what, what I mean is that. He's now got this God complex Vin Diesel. So Dominic Toretto is now, when you say about the superhero thing, Dave, I have no problem with any of the other characters. Even like Brian in this, who all of a sudden has gone from like, he, he could never fight like that in the other movies. Mm -hmm. He's now like, basically, he's got Jackie Chan's, yeah, they basically downloaded Jackie Chan's John moveset. Claude Van Damme in there. That's what I mean. Thing, he's, he's, he? Yeah, he's, he's taken on Tony Jaa, who's like, yeah. so massively talented in, in exactly. his field of martial arts. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, and he's took him on. But I think it's the Vin Diesel problem. I think he's absolutely got a god complex. I mean, this movie made one and a half billion. Mm. You know what I mean? It's ridiculous, the amount. And you're right, how does he make it? But it's one of the biggest, I think it's the biggest selling franchise, or one of them ever, you know, like for, for movies consistently, you know, box office and that, if not the number one, maybe, maybe near Transformers, something like that. But I think with the way he is in the movie, like even watching this now, and I've seen this one a few times, I am just like, there is no physical fucking way. Mm. Dominic Toretto, he is literally Superman in these movies, and it gets worse as the movies come on, and we get to like the nine, eight, nine, ten. Fuck me! I, I just think I think Vin Diesel's absolutely ruins these last few movies. And being honest, and this is the start of it because he literally could get a train come at him, and he'll just pick it with one hand and just push it back and go. I don't think so. You know what I mean? Like I just. I find it really difficult this time watching it. Even though I love Jason Statham, I love his martial arts, I love his character in this. I can show he's so good. But I think because Vin Diesel just does not want to give any ground. And him and The Rock had a massive fallout after this movie. Mm. The, the Rock of him was just like speaking again because he said Rock was going to chin him, I think, basically, saying he's an absolute felon. So he said something like um, that. There's, some, there's a, a bunch of candy asses working on the movie, didn't he? He, he said yeah. it in general, but everyone knew he was talking about Vin Diesel. Yeah, he was. And there's that line in, I think, sick one in it, when Luke, um, Tyree says something about, oh, my God, here's all the baby oil. It's always on TikTok, this. And The Rock, <laughs> it's off the cuff. The Rock goes, uh, yeah, yeah, for all your uh, for your forehead. And he's genuinely Tyree shit in it. Because him and The Rock had a big falling out after this movie. Like Tyrese is doing all these like monologues on Instagram, crying and all this. Like, you know, we have a family, we're brothers because then The Rock was doing 
Hobbs and Shaw as a splinter off, and they just completely fell out. The Rock got completely jetsoned out of the franchise. They all like the main characters were like, "Now nah, you're a Bella and mate," and him and him and um, Jason Statham went off and made Hobbs and Shaw. So there's proper drama in this. And I'm waffling here, Jack. I'm sorry not to railroad this, but I just find it fascinating watching this. Like this is just even for me now, it's just a stretch too far watching this some of the garbage that Diesel's trying to pedal. What's so fascinating is that he walked away from the franchise to begin with, didn't he? So they offered him yes. to come back in yeah. two, and he had no interest, like, no way. I'm done. I've done the one. And then they got him back for the cameo, she said, in three, which isn't a spoiler for Dave, because we literally see that scene in this movie. Yes, so when he goes to do, Japan yeah. and he meets up with, I can't remember the character's name, but he meets up with the lead character from Tokyo Drift, um, yeah. where after Han has been killed. Um yeah, another, well, another, another just, feature of these yeah. movies is that everyone's a superhero <laughs> because they can always come back. Um, yeah, so he'd walk away. Badly, he becomes a goodie. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating Sorry. how yeah. he's like so taken control of the franchise, hasn't he? To the point you're right, like Rock's yeah. not allowed to be in it anymore. Although I don't know, I don't know if he's in X or if he will come back for Eleven to finish it off. I, I do not much, know. To be fair, no, he wasn't. So, That's because of the falling out. Yeah. Yeah, but and even no, in this one, there there's a sorry, Dad, scheduling conflict. I I thought I read somewhere, The Rock was <laughs> filming um, Hercules, and so uh, yeah. he just wasn't available. So they had to, as well as the Walker stuff, they had to r- kind of write around that. Because even in this now. one, there's kind of yeah, I love that bit. There's hints in this, isn't there? Of there, perhaps it, perhaps the beef hadn't started, but their egos were clashing. There's weird, the weird yeah. moment in the hospital. Um, so uh, earlier in the movie, brilliant entrance for the state, isn't it? So in the first scene, he's gone to see Owen and we we pull back with him. I love this moment. And he's decimated yeah. everyone at the hospital, isn't he? It's just such an iconic yeah. opening. And then he has, a, there's other stuff, but then the mo- next most important part is he has the big fight with Hobbs, which shows just how much of a badass Deckard is because he essentially wins that fight, really, which is unusual for The Rock to lose any kind mm. of fight. He it's very 50 50 isn't it till he throws a grenade and it blows him out the window and Hobbs is put in hospital himself i think if his if his female counterpart wasn't there though i mm-hmm. thought that tipped the balance i i thought he was getting one over on Stath. i mean mm-hmm. uh, again you look at the size of him and i know size isn't everything but it's a lot it's not um, though yeah. <laughs> 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 so it, it was a good action scene that though i, I did quite like that um but oh my god some of the dialogue is so hammy it's ridiculous isn't it i'm gonna break your fingers eight ways or whatever it is he says to him and then uh, yeah just utter nonsense but the action was good i like the kind of way it was shot and like you know someone gets thrown over the cameras sort of going Mm. with them isn't it and yeah i kind of like that you get a rock bottom in there of course which is nice yeah yeah, you do. You do see that. And he, but he does it left-handed. He doesn't do the normal right-handed rock bottom. He, well, unless it's because of, they've not realised in the camera's reverse. But, yeah, he left hand rocks bottom. But you're right, it's a great fight scene. And, and you, you do again. I mean, Hobbs falls about fucking 300 metres out that window and to just, like, dust himself. Oh, God, oh, where am I? You know, like they do in these movies. Um, almost like uh, was it was it Harley Davidson and the Marlboro one day when we, when they jumped off the Vegas hotel into like a six foot pool or something they were about twenty <laughs> four yeah. and Tom Johnson and that just got Mickey wrote like oh gosh what's happened here you know what I mean like it was just nonsense but yeah I, I think that's the problem with this is it doesn't take itself seriously but then you, I, I don't know what it is with, with, with this maybe I shouldn't have gone not that I shouldn't have gone back so I was looking forward to the podcast obviously but I mean. Knowing I really enjoyed the franchise, even though it gets more ridiculous, but even this that fight scene's great. It, you know, Shaw is such a badass. And I think that's the problem because Shaw's supposed to be hunting him down because what's happened to his brother. So in his brother, Dave, he's Luke Evans, the uh, actor, short singer. He was the guy in the last in, in Fast Six. But it's fuck all like him. Their mum's Helen Mirren as well, who's <laughs> not in it at the moment, just to spoil that. But uh, she's the mum. With a, she's got a proper uh, Cockney accent, Dave. She really Cockney when she comes in it, like really over the That's top. Australian. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> you're right there, mate. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> now, that sounds Cockney. But uh, but yeah, so she's in it as the mum as well. So like the family are just this badass like UK. And I do like the fact that when when 
Stafe is driving anything. He's sort of, I know they're not really UK anymore, but he's driving an Aston Martin and stuff to say, like, he's from the UK, but it's Dom's driving the American muscle. Dom has always got an American muscle car. He's in a Chevy Camaro at one point and a Dodge as well and all that. So, yeah, it's very clever the way they do the little nods. But you're right, the dialogue means nothing. And at this point, Letty, who's his girlfriend, Michelle Rodriguez, his wife, she's the one in the first one. She's lost her memory, as you can probably tell. So, oh you, my you, god, is there so any more days of our lives? That's uh, classic, yeah. isn't it? I was like, are they really doing that? <laughs> Drake Ramore, Dave, Bobby, you, yeah. you before. <laughs> but, but so she's she. You're never going to watch them anyway. I know that. So at this point, but she basically ends up going undercover, doesn't she, Jack? In one of the other mm-hmm. movies, and she's like a bit of a. She goes from robbing cars. And being a mechanic and being Dom's squeeze, wearing like big sort of space hopper boots in the first one, to basically she is just a super agent as well. She's been protecting him from afar, sort of thing. And but he thinks she's dead and all this again. Like Jack said, everyone dies in this franchise, and mm-hmm. every single baddie in this franchise becomes a goodie. And I mean, every single baddie, pretty much. It's ridiculous. Like even the, in the last yeah. one, Jason Momoa is the baddie, and he is the baddie. But I still think in the next one, if he's still mm-hmm. alive or whatever, he will be a goodie. Are, are we talking about Fast 7 or just all the other movies? Ten. Correct? Just every, <laughs> every movie. No, every, every one, Dave. Every movie's the same. They're so, the same. I mean, yeah, they're so, they're so, so interlinked and you can almost swap, swap them out, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> this movie, it's yeah. just Dave. John Cena's in it John later Cena. on. Yeah, then it's Momoa. Yeah. It's just it's whoever's ridiculous. trendy and current at the time. Yeah, I like. Yeah. I really like that fight scene because I think it does set up the state as being a badass. And I really like the moment when he's in Hobbs's office and he comes in, and he just puts up one finger like, wait. Yeah. So it's a real sense of presence when he does that. And I've been watching a lot of Jackie Chan recently. Scott and I have been talking about um, the Police Story series, which I know you guys covered on VHS. Yeah. We've been doing all of them on um, 20th Century Geek. And this fight between the state and, and the rock has a kind of Jackie Chan-esque quality of like smashing through things and using objects around them. Yeah, it's cool. It's really, really good fun. And then it ends up with Hobbs in the hospital, doesn't it? And that's when yeah. that first moment of like Vin and Dwayne are not getting on. You can tell when you're watching it that James Wan has had to shoot around, as you said, Chris, their egos. It's like yeah. a big, bald head. It doesn't matter which one because they're both bald. It's like a big, bald head up close. Yeah, with yeah. the other one further behind. And it looks like a stand and it doesn't look like the actor. And then they cut back and again, it's the same bald head, but it's the same stand in, but now it's the other actor. Yeah. And they're barely shot together. Clearly, there's already issues going on between them at this point. Definitely. And and also all you need really is good old Frank from Samurai Cop going <laughs> in the corner because they are not together. That's a great spot. I was thinking No Retreat, No Surrender 3 where the, the uh, stunt actor gets swapped in for like the dad. <laughs> He's a free runner, really, the 65-year-old yeah. free runner, yeah. Does a fucking does a big spear, doesn't he? Like a Goldberg spear or something on that guy in No Retreat. But uh, yeah, he, there's stuff there, and like you say, Jack, that this this stuff with his daughter's a bit weird, isn't it? Like he, she's giving Dom a bit of aggro, saying, "Yeah, is this the guy? Who, you know, he kicked your ass and all this." He's like, "Yeah, mm-hmm. I think." And I can't do his accent, but he's got like one of the deepest voice, and he t- uh, Vin Diesel's like, "Yeah, I think uh, his, your dad's memory's gone or something like that." And I'm like, "Oh, come on, he's a kid. Let her have a <laughs> let her have a little mini that her dad's gonna beat everybody up. That's a hero. It's just." He's not an inch given. He's a, the machismo and the, and the actual testosterone. He's like some out of an eighties movie. There's just no giving this at all. Yeah, it's like the predator That's handshake, right. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the, the dialogue again. The, what was it? The Rock says something about uh, you know. I, I'm telling you, as a, a cop or whatever, to do this, but as a brother, you know, go and take him <laughs> out. <Yeah>. Basically, <laughs> like. Fuck you know. I just I have to say, right, I mean I, I'm shitting on it a bit there. I've just watched I won't spoil it for next week, but a fucking Hulk Hogan movie that Chris has made me watch. <laughs> right. <laughs> what a movie. So but essentially it's an action movie. And then I came to watch <laughs> like this and you get the state's introduction. And like you say, it's a bit ridiculous. I mean, it's almost Joker levels, isn't it? Mm. It's almost, the, the, in fact, there's more than a bit of Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises in this. We'll, we'll come on to that later, I'm sure. But um, 
you know, when he's walking out the the hospital and, and you're just thinking, well, it's ridiculous, isn't it? It's like a massive terror alert. Why, uh, he just gets into his car and drives off. But it, stylistically, it looked brilliant. And, and like I say, the way it's shot is fantastic. The fight sequences are amazing. <laughs> I was just thinking, it was like a breath of fresh air. It was like, <laughs> I've just watched fucking Shadow Warriors. <laughs> you know, straight, not even straight to video, straight to TV. Uh, so I I was trying to think, am I just calibrated for shit movies? But that that was the initial feeling. Then I kind of came into, okay, I see, I see now, I get it. It's a superhero movie and, and this, you're not supposed to take it too seriously. You're not supposed to question, oh, why would actors do certain things or why would this make sense or physics or, or any of that. Um, but then I, I think... For me, about halfway through, it kind of this does not need to be two hours. You know, it's just an excuse to get from one action scene and one Mm -hmm. set of stunts to the next. And so, for me, I I started to get fatigued. Like halfway through, it's like I I don't need any more now. I I get it. So yeah, that's my overall kind of impression of the movie. No, I think that's fair. The middle section in Abu Dhabi drags. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like that, that that's the bit they want. Well, that's who's paid for the movie, isn't it? Let's be honest. So that's the bit they want to be the, the, the key feature. But I think the action scene before it with the parachuting cars and the race down the hill to rescue Ramsey is for my money is as good as an action scene as you can, you can see. I know it's ridiculous and, you know, talking about physics defying, but I think, you know, when you watch behind the scenes, they did actually do that. They dropped some, some of those shots are real. They did actually parachute cars out the back of a plane. So it is possible, not quite in the way they choose to show it in the film. But, you know, we lord like Mad Max Fury Road and rightly so. It's an amazing movie and what they managed to achieve practically on that. But I think this matches Fury Road, this scene, in many ways. And some of the things they're able to do and like when the cars link up and they're all pushing together towards the truck. Again, that's all practical. Mm. That's real drivers doing that. And I think this scene is really propulsive and really exciting and has the sense of danger. And it's so interesting because we're watching this whole movie, knowing that we've lost Paul Walker in real life. Mm. And that a lot of the scenes, I think two thirds of it almost actually are his brothers or a stand in um, John Brotherton. Mm. And they've like mapped his face over the top and the film sort of plays with that idea it keeps putting brian in danger of dying and it makes you wonder as you're watching it yeah like (laughs) are they going to kill him off in the movie because they can't Mm. because he because he's not and they they keep putting him in these like really dangerous situations and it's i don't know if it's distasteful or if it's meta or it's clever or if it was always the script anyway but again it gives it that heightened sense of of danger which at other points you don't have it because you know as you said, Chris, they die and they come back, or they're superheroes, Dave, as you said. Not this one. No. no. Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was slightly distasteful, to be honest. I, mm. I thought if I was watching it in real time, you know, they're, they're almost saying to the audience, aren't they? They're the ones in the audience say, oh, this is how they're going to do it. This is how they're yeah. going to kill him off kind of thing and it oh no he survived and you know even when he's running up the the side of the bus or whatever the, the truck is like, oh is he gonna get away you know there's real peril because there's not real peril for anyone else in the movie <laughs> at all it, anything can happen anything goes but yeah I, th- I thought uh i thought that was deliberate what they were doing there but i i agree with the the whole action scene there the car chasing what I'd say, getting getting back to Stath though, I thought his introduction was great. I thought his fight, initial fight with the Rock, was great. But after that, he just sort of seems to randomly pop up in different places. <laughs> I mean, they they they're doing the whole X Men thing, you know. They mm-hmm. they're trying to rescue yeah. uh, a girl X-Men from Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, all the X Men ones. To oh, be yeah. Yeah. They, you know, they're always catching a train or something, but. And and then he just fucking appears. It's like from from out of the forest. It's like, did you know this whole plan? <laughs> Were you waiting there? I, I just it was bizarre. And then he, he disappears again. I, I, he's not really used 
that well for me. You know, he, he sort of used very sparingly throughout the movie. And that, again, I feel, well, there was this thing that happened, obviously, and, and maybe maybe originally he was playing a bigger role and they had to completely rewrite it, and that's what makes it feel choppy. But, yeah, it's, it's weird. After such a great introduction into the movie, after that he just pops up here and there. Yeah, and, and even to the point of the driving, Dave, there's not really an explanation, it's a Jack, about like why he's such a good driver. Like Dom, we've had all the movies. He's not like they said, oh, yeah, he was a, you know, a Formula One racer or he was a, maybe a rallycross driver, and then uh, he just decided, fuck it, I want to earn some money being a, a massive drug dealing or you know, some career criminal or something. He's literally can drive as good as Dominic Toretto, who is this... Mm-hmm street racer from LA and we've seen obviously we've seen the context of the other movies if you have watched them about how good mm. Dom is you know you, your life said a quarter of a mile and all that bullshit <laughs> that he talks you know it's the longest quarter miles ever but the but he does race at them there's no reason for it and he but he matches him he's in this like sort of armed jeep type dune buggy thing he's in Dom's in a fucking Dodge Charger again that's got like the um, there's a Porsche actually that they have it's like a cross country Porsche that they do like the Dakar racing and stuff like that and Dom's for no context at all has just got this Dodge Charger so he's actually sought out a what at the time would have been a 45 year old car and put it on jack stands in a frame and just just like where has this money come from we've not seen the 18 build this why mm-hmm. are you yeah Ruining where's a classic car. Yeah, where's BA in a welding <laughs> kit and stuff like that? Like, why why are you wasting your money on this? And that that's what always gets me about the movies as it's got on. It's like they have got amazing cars that they just wreck. And I know <laughs> as the movies go on, they get richer and richer, but it's sort of like you won't fucking do that. When they go to Dubai, they're both pulling one of them's got a, a Bugatti Veyron. It's a fucking one, it's the fastest production car on the world at the time it was. I think there's only one more can beat it. 235 miles it can go. It's got fucking like millions of pounds. And they're just like driving around Dubai. And it's like, oh, I wonder where that American fucking, you know, crack commando team are. Oh, I don't know. Hang on a minute. We've got a yellow, a red, a fuck. Oh, we need him as Optimus Prime. There's that many. It's like the Transformers had <laughs> turned up. At that point, and they all get out together, don't they, in a line, and all of them are there doing like the old Reservoir Dogs thing. They all get out in this because <laughs> Vin Diesel must have it in his contract to have the most slow motion looks. <laughs> as soon as he gets out, he's like, he's like, he? like looking dead mean, and he like looking round and like, he, and he's like, but you're a bald headed guy with the same <laughs> team. You're huge. You're in Dubai. Oh, I wonder where D- Dominic Toretto is. Oh, I don't know. We're never going to find him. He's not even driving an American muscle car over there. We've six other sports cars behind him. No, that's definitely not him. We're in Dubai. Everyone's loaded. Of course they are. It's fucking bollocks, in it? And they just get in anywhere. This guy, they've met nowhere. I've sold you stuff. It's in the car, the biggest hyper car in the world. I'll tell you what. It's in the top of one of the buildings. I thought he went in the Burj Khalifa. He's like, we're in the top of that building, right at the top he is. <laughs> just to tell you, how's he got it up there? He's a billionaire. Does it matter? Yeah, because it doesn't make fucking sense. You know what I mean? Like, it, you know, in, in that Dubai bit, there's one, there's one bit where you get a very stylized, you know, you get one car pull up, then the next car pull up, then the next car that's pull it, up. That's it, yeah. There's yeah, four, yeah. four cars. But then you get the front-on shot, mm. and then it's like, well, how did they drive up there? Like, like where the cars were, they couldn't, they couldn't have driven up. It was just a mad bit of continuity that just really did my head in. But um, maybe you guys can explain this bit to me because when when Toretto and Shaw like play <laughs> chicken and none of them gives up, and then but they both just uh, just shake it off and, and get out. And then he looks and he's like, oh, he's got a reinforced chassis or whatever. Right. But but both cars are totaled. <laughs> what is the? I don't get what the point was. So he's got a reinforced chassis. Did the square root of fuck all to help him? You know, but also Toretto was fine. I, I didn't get that at all. Uh, he's clever, or, Dave. Or am I just look? Am I just looking for logic no, no, no. somewhere? <laughs> he's 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 really clever, isn't he, Jack? He's like. Dom, Dom has got it there. You don't understand that. And the, and the thing is, the force of that crash, they'd have both been dead. Head on. Yeah. And, and, you know, because usually you've got one of them bottles it, don't they, and goes, oh, fuck that, and they'll crash off or they'll do something. 
and they must be about 80 miles an hour. The sheer force of two vehicles hitting at 80 miles an hour would just shred it. I don't care what reinforcement you've got. You've not got like, he's not got, you know. But if you've got one that's reinforced and one that's not, yep. then surely he should have just plowed through Toretto's car. That's yeah. why I thought it was just a weird thing to put in there. Yeah, I think you're looking for logic, which, as you, you know, you, you called yourself out for that <laughs> in this movie, which you're not going to find. But I, I think it's also storytelling. I think we're meant to here be seeing that Shaw knows Dom, and he knows that his car would not normally stand a chance against this big American muscle. So he knows if he's going to go up against Dom, he's got to find ways to... So I think, actually, it's more of a storytelling device than it's meant to be... Uh, you know, like a, a lot, it's not meant to practical make thing. sense. Yeah, practical. Thank you. That's the word I was searching mm. for. I think it's meant to show us who Shaw is and how well he knows Dom. And then the fact that neither of them pull out goes to show, like, that was the wrong phrase, wasn't it? Um, it would be a totally different <laughs> movie if even with Will or weren't pulling out. Um, yeah, there's plenty of machismo. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> neither, neither, neither of them, like, steer out the way from each other, do they? So I think it's meant to be, again, you know, that sense of, like, how strong and manly and brave and neither will ever give up. And, so yeah, I think it's all meant to be storytelling, really. Right. So so actually, Shaw's car should have been told, like given the mm. respective size and weight and everything, and that's what Toretto was expecting. So he was mm-hmm. surprised that it wasn't. Maybe okay. Yeah, I, I think that's that. exactly it. Because then when they get out the cars, isn't it? It's like Toretto's ready mm-hmm. for a fight, and Shaw was like, "You thought this was going to be a street fight? No way." He's like <laughs> showing at this point he's always got the upper hand, and he's out thinking him. And mm-hmm. I think that's what it was meant to be. Yeah, and, and I think you're right. Like you said, that line's great, and you thought this was going to be a street fight. It's like, well, it is, you know. And it's like, come on, you know that that that's the thing, isn't it? Like you look at. The way it's shot, it's fantastic the way it's shot. And some of the scenes are just so good. But the fucking acting, you've got like The Rock, who's who's another, I would say Keanu Reeves daughter all the time, but he's, he's a two-line actor. He can't do any more than two lines. Vin Diesel's the same. He, he, you get him off the two lines of dialogue and you are fucked, basically. That's why you've got like, you know, Tyrese is quite underrated in this one. He was actually the main character in Too Fast, Too Furious, but in all these other ones, he's like the comedy relief, but he wasn't the comedy relief, really. He was a wise ass in Too Fast, Too Furious, but in these later ones, he's sort of like the joke of the actual gang. When they go in, in that like that building, he's like, do what you do best, and he's like wishing some girl, which is a bit creepy, happy birthday and stuff, you know, and, and it didn't make any sense, and you've got Ludacris there going, oh, no, tell me you've not just done it, because they're together, they're like uh, good friends, but his character is so diluted. He, in, in the second movie, he did give Dom a good go at a fight and stuff. He was a top racer, everything, but he's like, it's just, it, it's so bizarre the way with the dynamic of the characters. Even Ludacris, he wasn't really a tech guy in Too Fast, Too Furious, but now he's like fucking Elon Musk or something, you know, like he's absolutely <laughs> like, he can, he can do just anything. Just the encryption. <laughs> yeah, it's just bizarre. And then obviously you've got the girl out of Hollyoaks who was in Game of Thrones. She, appears in this next minute she's like part of the team and spoiler alert dave she's still part of the team in fast 10 you know like, you know so it's like everyone who joins in if they're okay you're in the team your family you know your family and all that bullshit you know it's just and, and there is like jack said that you know with the staff being in it, it it's a shame and maybe it is the rewrites because He's so diluted. And again, it's the Vin Diesel factor again. The ego is fucking off the charts in this. Like, he, he just, even the fight with Statham, he's like, you know, The Rock is miles bigger than, than Dominic Terrell, like I say. And, and but, but for some reason, when he has to fight with fucking Deckard, he picks him up like it's fucking B.A. Baracus <laughs> or someone, and he just picks him up in the air, just physically carries him. It's just like, The Rock didn't even do that. And he's twice the size, you know, it's, it's just... Dominic Toretto, this is where he goes full on Incredible Hulk in this one, and it's just not believable. Well, he did do the Hulk smash sort of thing, didn't he? The the problem with the street fight, the street always wins. Hulk smash, and then just takes him down. It's Dave, it's not the worst bit. In I think it's eight or nine, there's a scene in the lift, and he literally does a Neo against Mr. Agent Smith. You know, the second one, they all pile on. Yeah, yeah. And he literally does that in a in the lift shaft. It is fucking <laughs> ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But that bit with the Hulk smash is nonsense. Absolute nonsense. 
it is interesting to know or to, to, to speculate isn't it like what it would have been i think there's a definite metaness to this movie where they know what they're doing and i think we can yes. see that in like kurt russell and his performance we can see it in like, the, the 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 scene you mentioned chris like roman is meant to be the annoying distraction so they use yeah. him that way on the mission um there's the scene when they're all getting ready before the like the big final battle and the, the way that brian tyler's score like soars and drops and dips i think it's all very very deliberate so i think that metaness is there so i don't know whether it would have been any different for for deckard Shaw because i think it's kind of part of the joke is that oh here he is again oh he's putting he's causing problems once more and dave you mentioned you know the Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises, and lots of blockbusters were influenced, weren't they, by Nolan at that point. And this is definitely another one of those where, like, the Stath character, Deckard Shaw, is kind of the Joker, and he pops up at the worst times, and he's always one step ahead. And mm. I don't know. I, I think probably Deckard and, and Stath would have been this the same amount because that was always the intention, I think. And they wanted him for the, the previous one. They wanted him to be Owen in um, Far Six but he couldn't do it at that point because he was signed up to Wildcard and Parker. So they've been trying to get him in the franchise for a while and they, they knew what kind of impact he was going to bring to it. Mm. I think the, before I forget the, the Dark Knight rises bit. So, so the definitely Dark Knight and the Joker was, was what I was initially thinking, but with the, I, I thought Kurt Russell was great in this, by the way. I, I thought he played a really interesting role there. You know, it, it basically is a side character, really. It's almost like Expendables, it feels like, mm. this this franchise. But um, the whole God's Eye thing, well, that's Lucius Fox's little mobile trick, isn't mm. it, from Dark Knight Rises? So I, I'm not sure if that was completely lifted, but it just reminded me of that. That, that's Dark Knight as well, isn't it? That's the second one. Because that's how they catch Is the, the Joker, one? isn't it? Yeah. You're right. You're right. It is. I was thinking it was the the. I was thinking it was Dark Knight Rises, but you're right. It's Dark Knight. Yeah. I mean, I think. The, oh, sorry, Jack. No, I was going to say like I'm just repeating myself. Really, isn't it? like the imprint of that that movie in 2012, no, 2018, Dark Knight wasn't it? Dark Knight Rises 2012, like went on for like a decade. I would have said the amount of like blockbusters you can like point at and say that that influence is is mad. It was a great movie though. That, uh, yeah. What did you say? Dark, Dark Knight was 2012? 2008, then, I think. 12. 2008. Yeah, 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 that sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Dark Knight Rises, yeah. 2012. 12. Yeah, they, they watched it then, but it's funny, you know, because I was so at Jason Momoa. Mm. He is brilliant. I won't say anymore, but he literally does the Joker. He does a Heath Ledger in Fast 10, Fast X. He, he mm. is the one that everyone raves about his performance, Dave, like, and, and Jack. And I'm not to ruin it because I'm very wary of the fact that you've, you've not seen it yet. But, the, but his performance is very, very good, really mm. good. You wouldn't think it was him considering like Aquaman and stuff like that. He really leans into that Joker type baddie, you know, like the silliness of it all. He, 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 he's the only one, I think, in the latest movie who gets the memo about, like you were saying, about the meta awareness, Jack, of, of like getting why he's actually there and he makes it fun when he's on screen. So that's, that's a plus of the latest one. Other mm. than that, we just, yeah. Anyway, uh, but yeah. So, sorry. I just cut across you there. I was going to say Joker's good. But what about the other villains? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I, I, I realized, right. We, we were talking about dark Knight for ages and I thought, hang about, there's something missing here. We've not done this for ages, Chris, but uh, <laughs> break out the old Bane and Batman impressions. <laughs> hero, hero, this is just a man. <laughs> right, go on, sorry. Go on. I mean, Toretto's not too far off, is he? No, mm. and, and I think that's like, we, you know, obviously this is about the state. And like you were saying, Dave, about is it because of what happened to Paul, Paul Walker? Is it that? And like you say, Jackie, I don't think it was. It's just nobody who comes up against Dominic Toretto, even if they are like Deckard Shaw, who is absolute nails, he's a martial artist, he's a, a, a spec ops, you know, like there's only really Hobbs who could go one-on-one, -on -one, who is Hobbs, he's a gun specialist. Dominic Toretto has never been a, a guy who can shoot guns. He, he gets a fucking shotgun out. That's what he's renowned for. In the first movie, 
he goes to get the, the Dodge Charger. He's got a shotgun to go against that Asian biker gang who, you know, killed uh, Jesse in that and the, in the, the, the Volkswagen Jetta and that. Uh, so he goes after them. He's not like he's a Bri- Brian's got a gun. Brian's FBI at the time, and he, he obviously can shoot and stuff. So he's not renowned for that. But you've got this guy who's he's even trying to shoot him with a sniper rifle when. I mean, that seems ridiculous anyway. When, like, Dom's on the edge of that cliff with the the, the the hacker and all them cars are surrounding him and he thinks, I'll tell you what, they'll never see me if I do a load of donuts. And turns the <laughs> other way, keeps smiling. You can clearly see that the baddies can see the back of his car. Why, why are they counting? It's like, I mean, they count. it's like <laughs> Batman 66, isn't it? And then he's like, he's like to the girl, get your, get your helmet on. And she's like, Why? Get your helmet on. She turns and goes, she going, you're looking the wrong way. And it's like, <laughs> here we fucking go. But you've got that Deckard Shaw's there for ages with a sniper. And there's a bit of fucking sand there. It's like, he's a crack shot. He the top fucking Dom out. And these other guys just stand there like it. It just makes, again, it's all flexing Vin Diesel's. He's obviously got a fucking little dick or something, hasn't he? Because he's just absolutely <laughs> flexing all the testosterone possible in this movie that's just that's just where i think it just gets too much and it's such a waste of jason Statham because really i always like brian's character more than i like dom's i love dom for the like he's a psycho and you don't really see him fight a lot really in the first movie but you know when he picks brian up when he's fighting over the tuna sandwich and everything in the mm-hmm. first one and then you've got like he levers the, the Johnny Tran it, it, at that point when, when they're at the race wars and everything, and he absolutely, I mean, you hear the story about how he ki- kills that, well, at least he kills that guy with a tyre wrench because he's the one who did his dad and everything, and he's like, you know, he served time in jail. So you know he's not someone to fuck with. But as it goes on, he's just, fuck me, he's took all the vitamins. Hulk Hogan has been supplying him. He's just absolutely on an ego trip, and that's just, I just can't buy it. He's so stiff. And when he gets angry and he stands there, he does this weird thing and he's like, with his chest out like this, he's like, and he stands there, don't he? And it's like, you just look like you've shit yourself, mate. You look like you've shit your pants. <laughs> and you're trying not to make it worse and go through your undies or something. You're like, it's like waddling. And he just, ah, oh, he's just weird. He's very, very bizarre. I really, I don't dislike him, but I really, really struggle watching him towards the end because I think... You were saying, Dave, about leaning into the Paul Walker tragedy. Mm. It also, unfortunately, it also elevated the franchise as well. And that's why this movie made all the money, because of the reshoots with his brothers being... I mean, both his brothers are are unbelievable. They look like him. His older brother looks more like him than him. But Cody Walker is a driver. I follow Cody Walker on Facebook, actually, because... off the back of all this. And he does a lot of charity work through, through his brothers, like charity and everything with, with um, Paul Walker's daughter, but he's really, they're both good-looking guys, but the older one is more like him, but Cody was used more for the shots because he'd done a bit of acting and stuff. So, yeah, it's it's, it's a sad story, but this elevated the franchise, unfortunately, or fortunately. I mean, it clearly did. I mean, even with the reshoots, it was $190 million budget, but $1.5 billion. Yeah, it's bonkers, ridiculous. isn't it? It's ridiculous money. Yeah. I mean, it's by far and away the state's biggest success by a long margin, by a big old margin. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Trying to think of any anything that would come close. What What was the I mean, one? You the and I did, Jack, did turn it up. I mean, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not 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 quite as much. I mean, really, it's the fast. I've got, I've got the list. They're really, the fasts are all his big hitters, and then the Megs mm. are the next ones. Really, Meg, Megs really well. were pretty big, weren't they? Yeah, that's not, not anything made, in the, made half a billion. Yeah, not not in this kind of. Th- these are your proper big hitters up there with your Avengers movies, your yeah. avatars, and things like that. So yeah, but don't forget. I mean, the Meg. He seems fucking believable when he twats that <laughs> fucking Meg in the last one. Yeah, I believe that more than anything that I'm watching at the moment on on you know Fast Seven. Like, you know what I mean. The thing is, as well, obviously, Michelle Rodriguez's character, she fights against Ronda Rousey at the mm. time as the UFC women's champion. You know, she's the security detail. They have a, a really good scrap and everything. And they get out of the building, don't they? That again, you know what I think ruins it for the Dubai scenes is Mission Impossible did it better. Tom yeah. Cruise down the side of the Burj Khalifa. We've seen Dubai 
it was it was a very strange choice i find when i watch it now is because i know what happens in like mission impossible and how clever that was and what he did by going down the side of the building and we know he did it and then you've got fucking vin diesel doing a bunny hop from one building to the next you know landing perfectly you know it's just yeah i just I, I don't i don't know it just doesn't execute I think the way it should, and you even get Brian telling us about the vehicle. It's uh, not to sixteen three, but two point six seconds, and it's blah blah blah. The seven hundred. Why is it up here? It's like why the fuck do you care? Just get in the car and get the fuck out of there because Jason Statham's there, a big bazooka, and he's gonna <laughs> fucking kill you. Why are you having this dialogue? You know, it's just things like that are just far f- ridiculous, even more ridiculous than Tom Cruise running down the side of the Burj Khalifa. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I thought I was going to be coming in as the baddie <laughs> and you were going to be loving it, Chris. And, and I think you've shit on it more than me. That's not when back on now. That's it. I mean, this whole sequence is, is Mission Impossible, isn't it? And I think it's Abu yeah. Dhabi, isn't it? Which is obviously D- uh, Dubai. Yeah, Sorry, close, yeah. close by, yes. Yeah, similar, isn't it? So I think clearly they were inspired by that one to do their own version, didn't they? And like I say, I imagine some Abu Dhabi money came their way in order for them to decide to do a big long sequence here do you mean but like corona yeah uh, oh yeah i know <laughs> i was just about to talk about that because you mentioned kurt russell earlier and he's the guy who's funding all of this isn't he because he's some shadowy government agent mm. and again dave you mentioned expendables that is that coming back to the idea of the bruce willis character and then the subsequent um harrison ford character in those movies so he's funding it all isn't he he's the guy who's putting them all up so it does have that sense that scene is hilarious isn't it i like a belgian <laughs> ale i'm a corona man and he's just got a massive... It's almost like airplane or something yeah, like that, yeah. or naked gun. Where it's... Well, it's like these videos oh, no, I'll tell you what around it is. at the moment, these Star Wars videos that you started us watching, these Sylvester yeah. videos, it's like that. It's almost <laughs> as bad. It is the, um, it's Wayne's World, is what it is. Mm. You know, oh, where yeah, Wayne's yeah. like, I'll never sell out, but I drink Pepsi, the taste of a new generation, and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> I'm more of a Corona man myself. <laughs> yeah, it's oh, ridiculous. But but fits in the world, I suppose. I mean, they've always drunk Corona. So that has been a thing that's been pers- uh, consistent all the way through. Every time they have a barbecue, which is pretty much every movie, they're all drinking yeah. Corona on this. So that's been there from the start as well. Yeah, and, and also, like... <laughs> You were laughing before about the, the the Hulk smash bit, but the end sequence where they're fighting, you know, it's the old, if we're going to go thinking with this fucking God thing, let's go back to where we know. I'll tell you what, just oh, yeah. bring a war to Los Angeles. <laughs> just bring a war. The government <laughs> and the fucking LAPD are not going to be bothered one bit about this full-on escalated war on the streets. And they're like, we'll have more guns. Who buy? Nobody comes out with guns at all, do they? You know, I mean, the, the iconic house gets blown up at the start. That's a pretty good scene, to be fair. That is iconic, that house uh, in a, the, the series. That's like the Toretto's house. It's still there to this day. It gets loads of people going, you know, to it. Really? But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a genuine house, that. Yeah. So, so, and it is, it's iconic. But, but again, we've got to keep moving within a two mile radius because of the hacking. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> really fucking really yeah okay and then as you, usual you, you just mentioned about the house blowing up but all i can think of just before that scene is is um brian's wife i, I can't remember her name but jordana brewster you know yeah. basically he's giving up yeah. his is uh, brian's giving up his life uh, with this you know uh high octane lifestyle and whatever and she's like Oh, he really misses it, you know. He's he's sort of settled down, and uh, he's a family man now. But oh, I can tell he misses it so much. I'm like, fucking hell! Can you make it any more obvious? This is written by a dude, <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know, this imaginary woman. Oh yeah, you, you should go out more and like tear it up a bit. And <laughs> it's just you such people. a nonsense scene. Yeah, <laughs> but even the you misses the teacher. bullets. <laughs> yeah, that is it. Yeah. Yeah. Them. it's the adrenaline, isn't it? Yeah. When- when when he drops little Jack off at school, how fit is that teacher? Oh, it's ridiculous. I'm thinking, isn't it? <laughs> you, you, know, know like... you know what I was thinking was the uh, what was it we were watching? Last Action Hero, where they go yes. into Blockbusters and they're like, "This is clearly a movie because they, this person <laughs> working at Blockbusters here is way too hot." And you know, the kindergarten yeah. teacher comes out; she's an absolute drop dead gorgeous model. <laughs> it's such nonsense. 
that that was that was it. That scene you saw right there. That that is it. Because I was thinking, I can't. I'm thinking. I'm sure she doesn't. He would never cheat on Mia. But I was thinking, and, you know, and, and Jordana Brewster's a really pretty lady. But I was thinking, I'd definitely be bunking up with the teacher. I'd be asking for detention <laughs> and everything. You know, it was just so random, wasn't it? It was like a Carry On movie or something, wasn't it? Like you know, Barbara Windsor. Oh yeah. Oh, you look like a very virile. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're, so you're the dad then? No, no. I just pick random kids off and drop them off at school and that. You know what I mean? It's just. Fucking weird. But she was stunning. It just looked so out of place, didn't it? Yeah. But not for this franchise, of course, because everyone is, aren't they? Everyone no. is beautiful and yeah. it, in real life, again, you know, we're looking for we're looking for logic where there is none to be found here. Um the Fast and Furious world is only populated by people from the last action hero world, Dave. You're absolutely right. That's exactly the right call. <laughs> Other Chris, I love the fact you called that out about the LA thing. I thought exactly the same on this watch. I was like, hang on. You've been, you've been, you've blown up a building in Abu Dhabi. You've had a big shootout in a warehouse in, still in Abu Dhabi, somewhere else out in the desert, which has resulted in the deaths of the whole of Kurt Russell's squad, um, including Shepard. And the guy that plays Shepard is another one of the body doubles for, for Paul Walker in the movie. Yeah. You've previously had this, you know, all these mad moments happening with like, Hobbs is in a hospital and buildings are destroyed and yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go back to busy streets and where all our family are from and our friends and what a great idea. Yeah, it's hilarious, isn't it? They think that's the right <laughs> thing to do. Yeah. The, the... Sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, go on, no, no, Dave, you don't have to talk. Long. No, I was go just going to say, there's bits of it that kind of reminded me of the James Bond franchise as well, that, you know, you're hopping around to these different exotic locations mm. and, and that, uh, you mentioned Mission Impossible, probably a bit of that as well, but I mean, that got it from the James Bond uh, sort of franchise as well. Yeah, it always it, comes uh, back to LA. It does, well, it does. <laughs> because even even like we state with um, The Rock, you know, the reintroduction of The Rock, you know, he knows full well that that is Dom and the team, doesn't he? They've mm. had no conversations other than when they left the, the airport. He Just obviously a random did. explosion. Yeah, he's a random, it's random. And, and yeah, and, and you know, what, you know, you were saying about the Dark Knight. You know, what it reminded me of there. It's a very good callback. Do you remember when the police fucking captain or the sergeants a shit house with you know, and and he's like, um, this is our city. We must defend it. You know, and he's like, he, he goes in hiding. Remember him with the bads, the, the the cop in Dark Knight Rises. I think he's made Christian Gordon's pal, and he the, the the tall thin one, the old bloke. He's about fifty. And, and Commissioner Gordon knocks on his door and he's like, you know, I'm not coming out to play. And then when the when oh, Batman yeah, comes yeah, back, yeah. Batman <laughs> comes back, doesn't he? He sees the sign and he's like, oh, that's it. I've got my fucking arm. Yeah, yeah. And that's what the rock does, doesn't he? He looks at his arm and goes, fuck medical science. Oh, oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That fucking Daddy's got to go to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here we go. You know what I mean? It's just fucking nonsense, isn't it? Like, absolute also, nonsense. He pops his plaster off. I mean, if he can do that, he doesn't need a fucking plaster on in the first place. <laughs> but he's still in his in his hospital room, and he gets all his full fucking riot gear on. I'm like, <laughs> was that just there? Was that just waiting at the side <laughs> for you to just get changed into it? Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. He's just in case we need it in this <laughs> moment. <laughs> I've been is waiting any- for this. Yeah, he's had a colostomy bag on for three weeks, but he's like, fuck yeah. that, it's all coming off. I'm back, you know what I mean? Come on, bitches, give me a load of fucking steroids. Let's pump it in, I'm ready. Let's take yeah. vitamins, I'm gone. And even then, like the rock, he comes from nowhere and that ambulance catches a fucking drone that must be doing about 200 mm-hmm. miles an hour. And he's unscathed and he's just come out of hospital where he's been for weeks and he he, he gets and then she's miles away letting she's talking to him like they're in the same room next to each other. She's like she says something goes, Oh, where's the backup? I am the backup woman or something like that. And I'm like, Oh, fuck me. You know, it's just brilliant. The rock and then that guy in the helicopter misses him completely. Completely misses him. He's firing Rambo's dad an M16. He's just like, fuck that. Here we go. And they're firing back at him and completely miss him. Absolutely amazing. Amazing that. I do really like the scene. It's ridiculous, but I think the concept is clever yeah. how they're driving around and you have to buy into it. You know, they're passing Ramsey, like they're passing a football through the windows of these cars that are going <laughs> 70 miles an hour and doing like 360 degree spins. But 
I think it's good fun, and I think again, it's meta. It knows what it's doing. It doesn't care. It's just like we're gonna we're just gonna go for it and have some fun. The the best thing about it though is the fact that we've got this kind of three way, haven't we? You know, we're doing the return of the jello ending. We've got this triptych ending. We've got the cars racing around. We've mm-hmm. got the bad guy in the helicopter, and then we've got the Stath and Vin having a fight in the car park, which we've referenced a couple yeah. of times with the Hulk smash. But they're fighting in the car park the whole time the rest of this is going on. And it feels like quite, it's a significant portion of the movie, right? It's 20 minutes, maybe. It feels like at least that, if not twice that, if not an hour of actual like real lifetime. <laughs> and in that time, Dom and, and Deckard are just constantly going at it with their with their weapons and then their fists. And then their, it's a long old fight. It's proper they live like style. Pete brawl. Griffin and the chicken. Oh, yeah, 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 it's like that. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, Jack, it's funny you should say this, and it would mean no reference to it, but Dave's alluded to what we're going to be covering in Shadow Warrior. Hulk Hogan has a fight mm. with Billy Blanks, Tybo legend, and that is the same 20 minutes they fight for. He's supposed to be the main character, but the rest of the fucking team saves the day. Well, he's rolling <laughs> around doing Tybo on top of his castle for like 20 minutes. It's absolutely nonsense fight. And that's the same thing. I mean, Dom from nowhere, he, he, you know, obviously he gets some sort of tire iron, Donnie Deckard, and then Dom picks up a bar mm. and they're fucking brawling and everything. And it's like, it, it's like turtles or something. They're samurai like warriors, <laughs> aren't they? Everything's like, D'Artagnan and all that stuff. And then, as I say, this is when you get the Hulk smash bit. It's just, I don't care how strong you are or how big you are. You are not knocking a fucking a, a top story of a car park down. But Dominic Terrell can do anything. But but if you also, let's say you did have the Hulk smash and you smash down on some concrete, the first thing you're going to take down is yourself. Yourself. Mm. Yes, yes. <laughs> 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 he Unbelievable. Been Ed, Ed Norton, Hulk, Annie at the end, you know, the old Hulk yeah. smash. It's just, yeah, it, amazing, amazing scene. But the car bit then, when he goes up, then Dom gets in the charger with the grenades and he does the old fucking Tony Hawks thing, fucking skateboard. He's doing the half pipe in a, in a two ton American muscle car. That Dodge Charge is one of the longest and heaviest muscle charge, muscle charge, muscle cars you can get. But old, good old Dom. Pulls out the nitrous at the end. I've come in proper, like, laying into this. I know more than I thought I would, but I got really frustrated. Sure. And, it, and, it, and I, it is wasted on the stafe. The stafe is wasted in this movie, Jack. The whole point I was talking about it. I didn't talk more about Vin Diesel because mm. he's such an egomaniac, but it's such a shame and a waste of a character. It's Deckard Shaw, I think, comes into his own in the later movies, if I'm being honest. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, Dave, you'll enjoy his character much more in the next one. And it's not much of a spoiler, mm. I don't think, to, to to tell you that. Um, and then of course, then well, he's you can see from his uh, IMDb is is in all the others. <laughs> yeah, set, yeah. Set him up. You... It's almost like um, Batman versus Superman, isn't it? With uh, Lex Luthor at the end, o- almost the the way it's shot and everything is. is oh uh, yeah, when he's in the prison. The yeah, yeah, yeah. I just he's Amazing. he's too big a name, isn't he? at this point i think the state as well i think they brought him in knowing he was going to have the same reinvigoration that the rock did in five during five mm-hmm. it was like now we've got to go up a notch let's get the rock in here it's like let's go up a notch so we're going to get the state in so i think it makes sense and we were talking before about like that that grow to this point and that kind of morbid curiosity probably that the the fans had to go and see this one and why it got up to 1.5 billion i mean as good as the dark knight is that had the same thing didn't it there was that morbid curiosity because Heath Ledger had died before The Dark Knight came out. So yeah. I think that probably yeah. helped to propel that a little bit. It's just kind of natural that the audiences flock to it, isn't it? And I think this film yeah. handles that. We can criticise perhaps, and I think rightly so, the sense of it playing with the audience, perhaps about the death of Brian. But the way they actually handle the end of the movie and dealing with him leaving the franchise is really po- poignant and really quite moving, I think. I don't know if you guys agree. No, I, I do. I, I think the ending's just, it's lovely. And the song, the song is like, you know, it was yeah. like number one, one at the song. So as soon as that kicks in and he's playing with me, there's a couple of scenes where you can clearly see, I think it's Cody, he's his younger brother. There's a bit where he turns when he picks, picks his ladder and puts him down to, mm. yeah, on the beach. And then, 
I mean, again, we're defying logic because Don's fucked off in his charger. Like, and that silver charger is like a thousand brake horsepower. It's not really used in any other movies. It's an absolute, it's in a lot of the Fast and Furious museum pieces that goes around the world, that car. Um, but Brian catches him up again. And then, you know, and he's looking at him in and all that. And, then, and it's nice the way he goes off, you know, the fork mm. in the road to dignify that. Because if you have got that Avengers, like we've got, an ending scene, but you don't have one in this. So I, I, I see it got me watching it. It's sad because it was a big part of like my movie life at the time because I loved the Fast and mm. Furious 10 years ago, you know, I really, and, and it's, it's an awful thing to say, but on YouTube he's actually, you know, you go down these rabbit holes. There is actually people who sadly filmed the car, the Porsche that he oh, was okay. in, Paul Walker. Yeah. There's the video of just as it happened, you, yeah, it's on YouTube anyway, but like, because you, you, his daughter sued Porsche and everything, because it was his best friend driving his car, and they said it was a defect. I think they actually won it in the end, the actual court case, because they, they couldn't get out of the car. Yeah, I think mm. his friend who was driving would have survived, so he uh, didn't survive, but Paul Walker may have survived. There was something that didn't allow him, which is awful. But yeah, so I think the ending is really lovely even now. It really does... Um, yeah, it's nice. it's nice. But I did see as well in the new one that's coming out, they may be using an AI version of Paul Walker because, mm. spoiler alert, Dave, I know I keep spoiling these things, but um, they don't necessarily finish off his character, in, in which I don't know whether that really works. They just sort of so wave that, it off. That's wrong. I, know, I mean, I there's, know. there's all of the, the negative things that people are concerned about with AI mm. and stuff like that. I mean, the guy is literally passed on. Let him fucking... Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. they, I don't know if the ending was perfect. I thought it was... When they're all sat around, you can obviously tell. And, and you, you can't escape that meta-awareness that, you know, they would have filmed this after the event. And, you know, mm. yeah. but they're sort of pretending that he's there and stuff. I just found it so I, so I thought it was better than like say killing him off in the in the uh movie at some point even though they teased it if they bring back AI Paul Walker I might change my opinion on that because you know but I th- I thought the way they handled it to to just have him settle down and stuff I thought that was good but I thought all that they've been through to just basically bugger off without you know, hugging it out or saying bye or whatever I thought was was just weird. And then obviously you get that bit at the end where the, there has been no CGI that is more obvious uh, than CGI Paul Walker there. And, uh, you know, in other places, I think it was less obvious, but it was almost mm. as if they, they, it was almost as if they tried to make it obvious that that wasn't actually him and that was, you know, a previous uh, previous footage, but I did like when the camera panned away, and then you see them going down different roads. I, mm. I thought that that was a really good moment, and I liked the the whole montage bit, you know. And Christ, he's a good he was a good looking bloke, wasn't he? You know, yeah. you get the footage from all the previous movies and stuff, and it it got me definitely, you know, because again, it, it, would it have done if what had happened in real life and that was just the story as it played out in you know and he paul walker was still with us probably not but i think you know it's no, wrapped i think up he's still in this, this tragedy mm. yeah but but no i mean if if you if he hadn't died but the movie still played out this way that mm-hmm, they wrote mm-hmm. out his character would it emotionally hit as much probably not but it, it sort of gets you because you you know this is you know, this is the end of his time kind of thing. Yeah, I hear what you say about that shot. That's really interesting. But that is a literal recreation of, of the first movie. So I think that's probably why it looks quite CGI compared to the rest. And the lighting is bright because it's daytime mm. rather than... Because the second fight with Tony Jar in the building is very, very dark. And I think that's because they're hiding mm-hmm. their stunt doubles and stuff. But this yeah, one, yeah, yeah. it's the look and he gives a smile and it's the exact yeah. moment that Vin and 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 um paul and that dom and brian have from the first movie so i think i kind of excuse mm. that because they really want to hit you with that that moment don't they it's just yeah. a shot on the beach when um it pans across the cast which is that kind of a bit cheesy that they're all sat there in a line so we can get to see them all and we've got the dom voiceover but michelle rodriguez is sat there and she's in floods of tears and that's that's real do you know what i mean that's 
Michelle Rodriguez crying. That's not Letty. Letty's not crying about yeah, the fact yeah. that, that Brian's driving off down the road. That's Michelle Rodriguez crying yeah. that Paul Walker can't be there anymore to film the scene with him. It's really powerful, mm-hmm. I think, at times, this section. Yeah, I agree. I think I think it delivers personally, but I, I do understand, David. I think you invested in the character. Mm. Yeah, really good, really good. Good ending, definitely, I agree with that. And then, we, as you said, we've got to set it up. We've got to set it up for the stage to come back. We've got this kind of, like you said, Chris, not really a, a post credits thing, but, you know, the idea that, you know, this is not the, the end of Deckard Shaw, absolutely. No, no. He, well, I suppose one thing, I just fuck it all up. He's naming a film Hobbs and Shaw. So if you were never sure whether he was going to come back, <laughs> it'd be pretty useless. Unless his mum's partnered up with The Rock. I don't know, Helen Mirren, but there you go. <laughs> That's another problem, not watching it in real time, right? So I, I knew of the Hobbs and Shaw movie, so there was no peril in this at all for me. And and again, mm. I, I kind of know that he's going to somehow, despite being this murderous bastard, he's going to somehow <laughs> end up being a hero because yep. I, I sort of saw the Hobbs and Shaw trailers, I think, you know, where he's, yeah. he's going to become this comedy buddy cop type thing. It's like... You've literally fucking slaughtered all these people in a hospital. You would never see the light of day again. But uh, yeah, I guess we have to get over that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are just going to have to completely forget that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when your film is made one and a half billion dollars, do you know what I mean? You're coming back. You do whatever. We'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll get there in the end. Got a couple of interesting um, little test little questions before we wrap up, if I, if I can yeah. try and. See how you get on with it. So, Dave, you yeah. mentioned how long this film was. It's two hours 20. It's probably 20 minutes too long, I agree. I think we could shave some of that off. How many lines of dialogue do you reckon the state has? Or, Chris, if you've read this in your trivia research, because I know you're great at it, let Dave go first. How many lines of dialogue does Deckard Shaw have? I'm going to go 15. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love the sound of grey men thinking, by the way. It's great. Um, <laughs> I, I've never researched this, Jack, so I can't even blag it. 21 lines. I mean, not bad, not bad. 17. You're like literally in the middle of the two of you. Oh, Dave's yeah. closer there by one. Well, no, I, I don't think it's quite in the middle, though, really, is it? I mean, <laughs> <won that closer. laughs> now the sound of men being competitive. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but actually it's interesting when you think about the impact he has in the movie and i know like we've had some criticisms they could have used him better perhaps but you remember him right like he if it yeah. had been a lesser actor perhaps like that deckard Shaw character would have come and gone because it's the state because he owns that role because he has such good screen presence because he always has good chemistry with it whoever he's acting against it feels like he's got more to do than that i think I think it's like the Darth Maul effect. Mm. You know, Darth mm-hmm. Maul had even less lines, didn't he? But mm. he was the most memorable thing about Phantom Menace. So I, I think you don't have to say much. And, and like you say, he's not saying anything when he just puts his finger up to the rock. <laughs> you know, little things like that, isn't it? And I think almost having less lines gives you the more of that mystique. So mm. I, I think... In some ways, it kind of works for him. Um, but let, let's see. I, I don't know, obviously, how his character develops. So I don't know, know if that <laughs> changes as he gets more lines, but I suspect not, I think. He develops. <laughs> Come on, Dave. Just say his character in the other movies. And also, it, you know, when he plays the monk in Mean Machine as well, he yeah. hardly says anything in that, does he? But yeah. really, really memorable character. Previous appearance of... of uh... Of somebody on this show right now, yeah. Me Machine. Yeah, yeah, Me Machine. Yeah, it was a good episode that, Jack, wasn't it? Of course, well, you read it. How could it not be? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's only to do the original, actually, at some point. The old, um, well, it's the Me Machine, but the longest, well, longest yard, but it is the Me Machine when I watched it as a kid, Burt Reynolds, definitely. Mm. All right. So this is not not really a question where one of you is going to win, I'm sorry. But um, I just wondered, you know, this is entry number seven. Where do you think this lies? And, you know, whether you can do this on top of your head, is quite difficult. I've obviously done some research. I've cheated. But 
seventh entry in a franchise, pretty hard to get to that point and still maintain quality, let alone be the biggest movie of the entire franchise, which this one still remains to this day. So can you think of a better seventh entry in a franchise than Furious 7? I can list some if it helps. I I haven't watched it, but Saw is another franchise where I think, you know, it's got a ridiculous number of sequels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's hit 10 now, isn't it? That's got Um, Saw X2. Yeah. The Last Jedi? Mm-hmm. Is it uh, Last Jedi? Was it, that, that's seven. No, yeah, it'd be Force Awakens, wouldn't it? It'd be seven. Yeah. Force Awakens. Yeah, Force Awakens mm-hmm. is a good one. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously. It's New Hope, though, isn't it? But they don't ruin it. <laughs> well, yeah. but it's New <laughs> Hope no, 1 or New Hope seven. 4. Yeah. King Go of the in. Kickboxers. Uh, seven. <laughs> I, tell, I, tell, I tell you, it was a good seventh one. Emmanuel Seven. Great. <laughs> great days. Great days. Red Shoe Diaries 7. Yeah, Red Shoe Diaries. Right? David Duchovny's <laughs> back. Yeah, yeah, I remember it well. Kim Brilliant. Go on, so rattle off some last... more for us, Jack. Well, the last Mission Impossible was number seven, wasn't it? So oh, that's that was decent. No, that is uh, good. Oh, yeah, that yeah that's that. pretty decent. Yeah, yeah. If we class film, Creed yeah. as a Rocky movie, that's the seventh Rocky movie. Now, Creed is good, actually. If we allow good. that, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. It's I mean, Rocky. there's no show. Sure. Sure. Rocky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. We can allow it if you say so. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, obviously, Chris, what we're missing is Star Trek Generations. That's for you. Ah, oh, fucking the, the nonsense. Best- <laughs> <laughs> Rapper can't buy bollocks. That's all I'll say to you. What a load of shit Star Trek is. But there you go. <laughs> Although there's another I'm link to, to, think what would, to Star Trek here as well. What, but... would, what would be the, the seventh MCU movie? Yeah, that's interesting. I guess he had it? Iron Man, he had Iron Man 2, he had Thor, uh, Captain America, he had Thor. Avengers. It would be Iron Man 3, wouldn't it? Avengers is 6, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you've yeah, got Iron Man, Iron Hulk, Man Iron Man 2, dip. haven't you? Yeah, oh, yeah Thor, Hulk's part Cap- of the canon. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I think it would be yeah, Iron yeah. Man 3, wouldn't it? No, I mean... Yeah, forget that one. It's impossible to gauge these things because we know in Max's favorite term it's all horses for courses anyway isn't it um <laughs> yeah but for this to have got that that big and that successful in this at the seventh go around i think is pretty impressive yeah i think so and also as we say unfortunately the, the people feed off tragedy don't they so mm. i think i don't think this was ever not going to be a success because people are intrigued how you infiltrate and and work around losing paul walker so you know, using the people love stuff like and I must admit I was intrigued watching it. I think that's what mm-hmm. it's the intrigue, unfortunately. When someone passes away, it's it's very you know, if it's with a movie or so someone like I, one of my favorite shows of all time, it's my favorite TV show of all time is I'll be the same pet. And in the second series, Gary Holton, who plays Wayne, dies. And he, he died of a drug overdose. This like nineteen eighty five, he was an ex uh, rock star. And he was into like heroin and all this stuff. So you can clearly see in that that there's a few scenes where he's not there. And the mm. the, the, the last episode, episode thirteen, they sort of um, do a little tribute to him at the start. But he died about three quarters of the way into the show. So any of the outside stuff, he's there. But anything where they're supposed to be in Spain, he's like one of them. They have to use a stunt double, and you see like a uh, bomber, who's the guy who fights. Sean, Co- uh, Sean Curry, uh, Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones and stuff. He's like the, the big guy who he fights mm. like at the airplane and then he fights him in, in one of the... But I never say never again, he fights against Sean Connery as well in the gym. He picks up this bloke who clearly isn't Gary Holton and just picks him up. He's got like a wig on and carries him out of the bar. But he died, like they say, and they had to use like body doubles or like use dialogue or Wayne's chat. He was always a womanizer. Wayne's chatting the girls up at the reception or whatever. So... I'm always intrigued watching that, even if I've watched that show so many times. But that they, I think the second series is the best series, but a lot of people say, and the people who, who made it, say blighted the, the obviously the, the memory, but the, the actual production because they had to rewrite everything. So um, yeah. I, I didn't, I, it's funny you just said that other day because I never thought that about leaning into his death stuff. I didn't, but now you've said it, it's so obvious that that's really strange, yeah. that, isn't it? Whether it's a subconscious thing or not, but it's pretty bad if it wasn't. 
I, I don't know uh, whether it's conscious or subconscious. Mm. I, I definitely felt it. Like there were a number of times, uh, and they were kind of nod into it. But um, things I, I was curious as as you were just talking there to go back and see how how does it match up with Fast and Furious Six, and it, it looks like that made seven hundred and eighty eight million. So I mean, it was still mm. for me exceeding yeah. what. I thought, you know, if you watch the first couple of movies, just run-of-the-mill car-type action movies, weren't they? So it still was on a trajectory. Mm. But that definitely took them into a, a different level there. But I kind of think to get one one and a half billion, that's not more and more people flocking because Paul Walker's dead. It, it's people going multiple times. Yeah. So I think that is the that would be interesting, wouldn't it? You know, I mean, you, you'd never know because you don't have to hand over your personal details when you go to the cinema, fortunately. But to to know whether it was it just lots of people who didn't know who Paul Walker was and then decided he he died, so let's go and see what this movie's all about, or was it just fans of the franchise? And whereas they go and watch maybe once Fast and Furious Six, well, because of this one, they they'd go two, three, four times. Mm. I I, I suspect it's maybe more that than lots of extra people who don't know the franchise. I mean, if you didn't know the franchise, an actor dies. Mm. I I, I don't think that would drag you to the cinema. It does sort of feel Mm. like it's hitting its zenith at this point as well, though. I think like... Like we said before, you know, you bring in the rock at number five, and that that's a massive kick on, and then six again up to nearly eight hundred million, and then this one, it feels like, and it's like I said at the start, it's like a little mini trilogy. Although we get Hobbs back in his own spin off, this is the end of him in the in the main franchise, and it's like a it's like a, a trilogy within this wider thing, um, much like Chris Star Trek two, three, and four. So Ratha Khan three to three such a spot to voyage home is obviously a mini trilogy within the wider star trek <laughs> franchise but I'm, 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 i know i'm just telling you stuff you already know um but, uh, <laughs> yeah, so it does yeah. feel like it's hitting that kind of kind of zenith point doesn't it well like it makes sense to me i think having seen the, the whole franchise and seeing where it goes and who's brought in at what points that this is this is the peak point that up until up until now they've done some stunt casting we had Gina Carano in the last one and like we've got Ronda Rousey in this one and it continues to keep adding people that add value and bring in a new audience but also continues to bring in at times depending on on who the cast is so like Tyrese in number two and then um The Rock and you were saying like his Simone Heritage Chris in five and it continues to add multicultural diversity to this already pretty diverse cast to be honest that is bringing in new and new audiences, I think, to the point where now we've got everyone. And as you had said, Dave, now they're going multiple, multiple, multiple times for the enjoyment, for the for the the, the Paul Walker factor, for, for whatever reason, yeah. Uh, it's just, it, it means a hell of a franchise. Whatever we think of the movie, people love it. It's popcorn stuff, isn't it? That's the thing. It's just pure cinema. So, uh, yeah. yeah, no, I've really enjoyed this chat. Really enjoyed this. And uh, Dave's just been so negative about the movie. It's been unbelievable, <laughs> to be honest. Oh, but... I'm pretty sure when I listened back, I, 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 was, I was raring to go. I was like, right, this fucking thing. But honestly, I, I, I know I said it hour and a half nearly ago now, but I, that was my overall impression coming away was, for me, two hours 20, you could have mm. shaved an hour off that and I'd have been cool with it. I just feel like there was just too much and I was just fatigued, genuinely Mm. fatigued by it. I think at the, the point where they do the X-Men scene, which was a great action scene to be fair, like you say, cut out all of that Abby Dabby stuff Mm -hmm. for me. I I didn't need it to be there. Um, All of the other things I could get over, you know, the, uh, the ridiculousness, the, the, (laughs) why, character gets from point a to point b none of it makes sense but i could forgive all of that but it was just tiring for me and and Mm. again i i I, at some point you know if chris stops making me watch all this shit reality tv i will watch the other movies in the franchise (laughs) but it's just uh it's it's not a priority and i'm hoping the others are a bit shorter 
<laughs> wow. Oh, sorry. To, sorry to disappoint you there. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've got at least five more hours of uh, no. Let's say because we've got Hobbs and Shaw, you've got at least six to seven more hours of Fast and Furious in your near future. I'm afraid. You know what? I, I did actually buy yeah. this one um, mm-hmm. because I I saw it was a it was four quid on Amazon, so I thought ah, I'll just buy it. And I think we'll, uh, watch I'll, it again. I'll look the others. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, th- I think I will at some point. You know, it, it, like say. For me, right up until that uh, that scene that I mentioned where, with the, the whole X-Men bit, I, I was really enjoying it. And like I say, okay, I get it. You know, and the, and the fact that it is utter nonsense, I, I get it. And the fact that, and, it, and even in Abu Dhabi, you know, it's so bright. And you've got mm-hmm. beautiful women on their screen throwing their tushies about and stuff. And it's like, what well, what is there not to like? But then, yeah, it, it's just, it got tiresome. I think for me, I could almost split it up into two and and treat it as two movies, and and then I'd I'd probably enjoy it more. Yeah, yeah fair. I agree. All right, mm-hmm. if you indulge me in a couple of letterbox reviews, and then I'll get the the final word from the two of you. Yep. Hit it. Yeah. Okay. Probably should have uh, kept my powder dry there, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'll have to give you the official rating because you know I haven't stolen yeah. it from any, anybody else's podcast, but I'll do that in just a sec. <laughs> All right. Zach Pope says five, six, seven, the best little trilogy. So much fun and just one hell of a time. Seven is easily the most emotional film for obvious reasons, but it works wonderfully. Plus. Statham just kills it in here as well as James Wan's directing. Wan's style is so great here. And we sort of touched on James Wan a little bit, but not much. I do think he does a cracking job directing this. As somebody who doesn't normally operate in this this world, he's come from sort of hmm. low-budget horror movies. Suddenly he's given $200 million to make this. I think he does a good job. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I, I think, you know, I always think the director's role is, I mean, unbelievable. I, I, I don't even, I can't wrap my head around it because to me, in, in my world, it's like a project manager, but it is so complicated because you, you must have a great team around you because, you know, they're getting all of the locations ready, all of the, making sure all the stunts are set up and are safe. You know, not all the movies make sure of that bit, but, you know, making sure all the actors are booked with all of their complicated schedules and stuff. The director's role is fucking hard. But whereas when you're doing a low budget movie and, and horrors, one of those franchises, uh, franchises, one of those genres where you can uh, do low budget quite well you don't have as much to worry about, you know, you don't, you don't shoot a scene and then have to update your producers, you know, at the end of the day, how's it going and whatever. Um, so it is a, for me, it's a completely different skill set, you know, and it's not to do with the actual product at the end. There's all of these extra stakeholders that you've got to keep happy and probably Mm. the amount of time that you can, you know, check you've got every shot and everything's working. It's probably reduced and, and you're spending more time on the phones with other people, keeping other people happy. So, yeah, for me, it's almost a different job doing a small budget movie versus doing a, a big budget movie. And, it, it, yeah, it made the transition well there. Mm. Good stuff. All right, Comrade Yui says, Jason Statham should start pulling a Lee Van Cleef and just play villains all the time. He's exceptionally good at it here and gives the series the only truly great antagonist that it ever had. So I just wonder what you thought, Chris, as a man that's in all of them. Do you think he is the best villain in all of the Fast and Furiouses? Uh, no, because I don't really see him as a villain. I think his brother's pretty good in the scene. Uh-huh. You know, Luke Evans, he's pretty good. He's a bit more convincing because... I think when he's introduced, he's like, yeah, yeah, you, you never really could see things through, little brother. You know, the scene at the start, you know, like you said, a magnificent scene where the whole hospital and spec ops people protect him are just dead, aren't they? It's almost like the Dark Knight that when he walks out of the hospital, you know, the joke and everything blows up around him. Um, no, I don't necessarily think I do because he's only a baddie in this. And even then you're thinking... But he's Jason Statham. He's not really a baddie, is he? You know what I mean? Even like the Jason Momoa stuff, he's, he, 
yeah, anyway, you know, it, it's the same. Whenever they bring somebody in, I don't necessarily think he is the worst, uh, the best baddie. I, mm. I don't think, I don't think he, in the whole series there isn't really a baddie. Like in in the fourth one, it's more the Rock chasing, and he's a copper, you know. Really, the Rock's chasing the mini through the favelas and out of Brazil, and he's really a bit of a baddie. He's just too, he's too much of a cop, so he's playing it all down the line. Whereas we're mm. like, we're vying for the antiheroes of like Dom and the team, aren't we? And Brian's ex cop and all that. So I'm not necessarily. I'd probably say the Rock is in the fourth one. If, but mm. no, I wouldn't say Stephen. I wouldn't. I think he's one of the best characters after this, after this movie. I think he's one of the best characters in the franchise because I think Jacob stavin has got a really dry wit and he's he's underused his one liners. In Expendables, he throws a few in there, but there's a few movies where he's in and I think he's got a very good sense of humor. Mm. It's that natural charisma, I think, that he has, isn't it? That you can't help but kind of be on his side, I suppose, a little bit. You don't want him to get yeah. get, get the, the familiar, of course, but um, it's the state, isn't it? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I agree. And the yeah, the Rock in in um in Fast Five, it is really, isn't it? He is the bad guy in that one. Yeah, he has this yeah. way of saying "summer bitch, summer bitch" in Fast Five. Yeah. He never does ever again. Five, not he four. Puts yeah, on a bit of, right. yeah, yeah. He puts on a bit of a southern accent, or puts on a bit of a. He's playing a bit of a character in Five, and then he forgets it for the rest of the the movies. But um, yeah, he gives up then. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. That's not unusual, though. I think for people. Um, you know, the MCU <laughs> with Elizabeth Olsen, she starts off doing this weird faux Russian to Kevin accent. Russian, then... the kind of Eastern European yeah. thing. And then, oh, I don't, I don't fancy that anymore. Yeah, I, I, I'd just give that up. <laughs> I'd just be American now. I think I've just totally lost my accent now. Yeah, absolutely. So here's a question for you, Jack, and sorry to break mm. format, but no, not at all. with Expendables, mm. do you think that has had a positive impact on Statham's career? Because it, for me, he's a bit of an outlier in that franchise because mm. he's someone who, you know, he's done his time in low budget, you know, movies and, you know, he's built himself up, built his brand. Whereas most of the Expendables, the, these were big, boom kind of characters from the 80s, weren't they? Who, who, who star shone incredibly brightly in that time. And then, you know, they bring them back. You've got Arnie, you've got Van Damme, you, you've got all these kind of uh, characters. Whereas Statham seemed like a bit of an outlier to me. He, he was someone who, it, it wasn't like his star shone really brightly and then faded away. It, it's been mm. gradually kind of building up. So I, I just wondered what you thought, because you're, you're closer to Statham's career mm. than probably anyone I know on the planet. So... I just wonder what you thought. <laughs> it's really interesting because I think before starting this project, I would have said that was the franchise which got him to where he is. But now having watched through, what, 36 movies now, this leaves me nine to go for now because we know Statham churned them out. <laughs> I think Expendables gave him a bit of street cred more than anything. It was, well, if Sly mm -hmm. is on the phone to Jason Statham, then, whoa, if he's acting alongside Dolph and Arnie and Bruce and mm. people are still talking about Jason Statham as in having a good impact to them, even people remem remembering his character. So I think it gave him that kind of kudos, perhaps. Mm. Whereas this is the film, really. This is the franchise, which, boom, suddenly everyone knows who Jason Statham is. Hmm. That's true. But That's true. Hopefully, one day he'll hear this and he'll want to come on and talk about it, and he'll let us know. That's the dream. <laughs> I'll be there if he is. <laughs> Last episode, surprise everybody! My guest today is Jason Statham himself. I mean, I wouldn't be able to talk, yeah. so it'd be a really shit episode. He'd have to talk a lot because I wouldn't know what to say and where to look and how to behave, and I'd be absolutely fanboying out. Yeah, and if if I, uh, Chris and I were there, I'd be like, Chris said you weren't the best villain in, uh, <laughs> yeah. in the Fast franchise. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> Outside. I think one of his best films, Wrath of Man, actually. I love that movie. That's yeah, a I'll great film. I can't wait to get yeah. to that one. It's a great movie, that. 
I still want it. I, I don't know how I'm going to do it because I, I, I don't want to pick it because I don't want to watch it myself. But that, um, the one with Burt Reynolds that that you had uh, Spider Dan on. Oh, oh yeah. Was it In the name now? of the king. Yeah. Oh, surrendous. <laughs> <laughs> don't slag Burt off now. Come on. Honestly, it, 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 I wondered if it was just me Not who slag Burt off. could not deal with yeah. it. But listening to the episode with you guys and i think angry andy was on as well i, I, he I was. was like yeah i'm glad I, it's one of the very few movies i've turned off halfway through i i'm such a completionist mm-hmm. if i start a movie even if it's not great I, I need to see it out it has to be exceptionally bad for me to turn it <laughs> off and yeah that was that was part of an exclusive list I think even you, Chris, couldn't get through that without having to have something to say. No. I mean, it's meant to be like a medieval epic. And at one point, he's wearing a black T-shirt. He just, he was just, fuck it, I'm doing what yeah. I want today. It's yeah. crazy, yeah. that movie. Hercules and Xena had better continuity and costuming. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. All right, I've got one, one more because I can't do an episode without referencing Lou Shoemaker nowadays. He says, this is a thrilling finale to the Fast and Furious franchise. Or at least it probably should have been. I have no idea what it's like to watch this movie without Paul Walker's death hanging over the movie. But the filmmakers handled it as well as they possibly could. And the movie feels like a fitting end for his character and everyone else too. It helps that these movies are already cheesy and about family. Leaning into that was a smart decision. The action is pretty solid too, with the highlight being the mountain bus attack. All that said... This isn't my favourite Fast and Furious movie, or even my second favourite. The plot is overly complicated. Michelle Rodriguez's I Still Have Amnesia subplot absolutely sucks. And most of the comedy is pretty cringeworthy. It's also where where the series starts to feel like Vin Diesel's fan fiction. Although that doesn't really explode until the next movie. (laughs) But what about Jason Statham? He's great. I'd like to see him play some more bad guys because he's perfect for it. Even though none of his lines are explicitly funny, his comedic timing really pays off here when he has to deliver an over-the-top threat. His introduction is not only the best scene in the movie, but probably the best scene in the... Hang on. His introduction is not only the best, his best scene in the movie, but probably the best scene in the movie. I love that his character is the biggest threat the team has ever fought, largely because he's <gasps> the first bankable movie star they ever faced off against. <laughs> Very true. Lots of agreement with us. And what Lou tends to do is say everything in one review that we take 90 minutes to do. Yeah. <laughs> but he teased us there because he said, like, oh, it's not even my favourite or my second favourite. Now yeah. I just want to know what's his favourite and second favourite. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's on, he's on Letterboxd. You'd have to go and find him. Another guy who, like, yeah. I don't know how I'd ever get in touch with him. Really, he deserves to be on here having his own say because I quote him every single episode. <laughs> you have to contact him, Jack. You got him. Probably, he probably has no idea, does he? Like, you know, you should reach out. I've tried to, I've tried to find him. I've tried. You bet he's not on X. He's not on those usual kind of social media places. The only place I can ever find him is on Letterbox, and it doesn't have that kind of social media connection to do that. You can comment on their reviews, right, but then you don't right. know if they ever see it or. It's not like a, you know, it's not even like a Discordy where you can, it's just you post a review and if you then you want to comment on that review, you can. Um, yeah, I don't know. One day we'll see. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. It's the time. Lou's had his say, but it's time to hear what you both think. I've only got the three categories, nice and simple. Within the stage filmography, is this a classic, worth catching, or for completists only? Who's going first? Um, I'll go first, if that's all right, Dave. I think it's got to catch it. If you're a Stave mm-hmm. fan, then then he, yeah, for him alone, he does play a good part in it. Um, just not enough, I think. Like I say, mm. fucking Vin Diesel's just tossing himself off in the corner, how great a fucking actor he is and all that bollocks. He thinks he's Robert De Niro and he's fucking not. Um, he's more like Ronald McDonald with the acting, he's absolutely useless. But but I will go with the stave. So I'd say if you are a complete not a completionist, but if you're into the stave, the action's good. If you love Fast and Furious, this is right up your street. But yeah, he is a very, very good baddie in it. It's just a shame that there's no real 
pay off in the other movies for his character in this, even though I think he's very good. And he should have kicked Dominic Toretto's ass because there's no fucking way <laughs> that he should have beaten Minify at all or The Rock. Absolute nonsense. But there you go. So I think I, I'm struggling a bit here because I, I'm kind of feeling like because of, not because of the state, but because of the whole Paul Walker thing, because this mm. made $1.5 at the box office, I, I think for those reasons, I kind of feel like it should probably go in the classic category. I, I feel like it, it's a movie, certainly if you're a cinephile, you know, you should watch it. I, I think it, 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 and it is good. I just feel like it could have been about half as long and still, I, I, I think if it was shorter, it would have been much better. And I think, unfortunately, you know, it's like it's like the James Bond villains, isn't it? Usually, you know, Bond isn't necessarily the biggest person or, or the Batman franchise. You know, the villains are the top villain generally. So, mm. you know, for the the way the movie starts, I think it it sets up so much, and then with the whole fight with uh, with Hobbs, you're thinking this is this is going to be jam-packed, but the fact is Hobbs is taken out of the movie through, you know, scheduling <laughs> difficulties. Uh, it's almost comedy the way Stath shows up every now and then just randomly in places where he should have no idea where, where <laughs> these people are. Uh, it, it's just, it's just a bit odd. So I think for that reason, it kind of tails off for me into the, the kind of middle category. So it's definitely, hmm. it's not just for completionists, but you know, it is a movie, movie well worth watching, uh, you know, and again, probably more than once, but yeah, I just can't bring myself to call it a classic for me. The, and I'm I'm looking through a state lens here, you know. I I think your your transporters, your cranks, those for me are the classic state movies. This one is, yeah, it, it's a level down from that. Hmm. Totally fair, bro. Thank you. So his biggest movie, probably I can't see anything ever meeting this, is worth catching. But that's fascinating, isn't it? By itself, that you know we know. Metrics, money don't always guarantee quality, do they? But what what was your score, Jack? I I don't I don't oft, I don't often do it to be honest. Um, Max is great. Max always asks me. So thank you for asking. Um, I don't even re- really think about. It. I don't I don't, pre- I don't prepare an answer for that. Um, I think I agree with everything you both said. I think as a movie. It's worth catching, but I think because of the impact it it's had on his career, I think it's a classic in his filmography. That's fair, yeah. So, it's, so okay. it's sort of somewhere in between. I think I think the importance it holds means it has to go into that classic category. But I think, yeah, as a film, it, I agree. There's there's ones that I've watched before, and there's ones we're going to watch later. You mentioned Wrath of Man, Chris. That I think as films are better than this. Yeah. Mm. I mean, there is that kind of reflected glory because, again, the, no one thinks Fast and Furious, apart from us on this call, but, you know, no one thinks Fast and Furious 7 and think the first thing they think is state. The the first thing you're thinking of is is Paul Walker, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't argue with the, the reflected glory of it. So Hollywood, you know, a lot of it is about box office, mm-hmm. you know, and... and you know, if you get this star, you know, is that a guaranteed box office return? And so, even though you know the the, it's not necessarily. Stath hasn't brought in one point five billion on his own. Mm. There, being associated with it, I mean, that can't have anything but a positive uh, impact on your career. 100%. Maybe he can just just claim it's the it's the missing seven hundred million that, from the last movie. If I was to say that's what I'd be walking around saying, yeah. well, you know, number six yeah. made eight hundred, but this one made one point five. So what's the difference? Yeah. Well, it's me, guys. <laughs> very true. Brilliant, very gents. True. Thank you very much. This is due to come out in the middle of March, so I don't know how far ahead you're thinking or what you know that's got coming up. You've hinted at a very exciting show coming out for the VHS, starring 
the, the, the second well, best action movie of all time, right? Hulk Hogan. Um, yeah, so what I, else have I you did, got lined up? I did this on a um, Star Wars clone. Clone mm. Wars conversations episode, and I, I kind of, I, I was saying for plugs, and I, I said something for the VHS that was coming up in a few weeks. Oh, okay. And Math was like, "Oh, I didn't know that was coming." Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, "Oh shit! I just spoiled it." Um. So I think I, I I'm gonna say we'll, we'll just keep it to. We've got Train Spotting Out this week, which is a great episode. Probably the longest VHS episode we've mm. had. We had Mike Burton on from Genuine Chit Chat and Star Wars Comics in Canon on there. It was a great kind of conversation about it. Lots of tangents and what have you. And then the next thing we've got coming out as we, we record, but it'll be in the past, obviously, is the uh, Shadow Warriors, also known as Assault on Devil's Island, <laughs> with... Keep me honest, Chris. There's we've got Hulk Hogan, we've got Crease uh, from Karate Kid. What, what was his name? Oh, uh, Weathers. Oh, uh, Mike Cove. Weathers as well. Mike Mike Cove. Mike yeah. Cove. yeah, we've got Shannon Billy Tweed. Blank, Shannon Tweed, the lovely Shannon Tweed. Uh, <laughs> lots and lots of B movie characters. Uh, what, what's his name? Drago. Billy Drago. Oh yeah, yeah. who's yeah, yeah. in uh, Back Ring for of my Death? Pit. Wasn't yeah. he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, so yeah, B movie fodder. Like I say, not even straight to video, but straight to fucking TV. So that we've got that one coming up next, and I'm gonna. I do. We do know what's coming after that, but I, I don't want to spoil it. No, no that's fair can. enough. And I'm also. Um, I will be on genuine chit chat podcast in the next. Uh, it should come out around about the same time as this one. I think Jack Doyle may have come out just before, but. Mike has asked me to come on because he is going to Las Vegas with Megan and uh, we're doing a double episode because that's where they will be getting married. So uh, I am going to be talking about Las Vegas because that's the only thing that I ever think of from the minute I get up to the minute I go to bed is Las Vegas. So uh, I cannot wait. You can see it over my shoulder there, even on my hands there. It's on the wall, but up and down. These are pictures everywhere. I've even got it written there on my arm, Las Vegas, there she is. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm going to try and give. We're going in September for our 25th wedding anniversary, so I'm going to try and give uh, Mike and Megan some tips before they go and just chat about my love for that place. So yeah, pretty boring if you hate Las Vegas and people are sick to death of me talking about. I'm sure Dave is, but I'll talk about it all day long. Love it. Uh, if you're in any doubt, I I am. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> I am expecting an afterthoughts though as well, you know, from Mike and Megan mm. live from Las Vegas. Afterthoughts, yeah, we'll be uh, listening for that. Yeah, definitely. Chris I, I, I thought an thought. afterthoughts about having to talk to Chris, but yeah, that makes sense too. Yeah, that that as well. <laughs> I'm always an afterthought. Jack. Everyone's like, what? Oh. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Good cheers, stuff. guys. Uh, thank you everyone else for listening, partaking in this journey with me through this day's filmography. That was Furious 7. Next up in a fortnight is the resurrection of Glenn Davis for the unlikely mechanic sequel, followed by the swift return of Chris and Dave to discuss Fast and Furious 8. I've been I'm Jack's Musings, that's J-A-C-S, and you can find me on X where I'm most active. You can also contact the show directly on X or Instagram under the name Back to the Filmog. Make sure you use the hashtag, follow the filmography. I'm also a proud member of the Comics and Ocean family, a super place full of the world's greatest people, dedicated to bringing you podcasts on a variety of geeky topics. So, please make sure you take the time to search, subscribe, and rate our shows whenever and wherever you listen. Until next time, be excellent to each other, and make sure you take the time to treat yourself too. I am Jack signing off. yippee movie lovers!